Good afternoon and welcome to Journal of a Medical Intuitive. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Lisa Vest, and today is March 29th, 2020, a couple weeks into a global pandemic. I've been on a bit of a hiatus with this podcast, and I thought now is probably a good time to start it back up. I'm listening to Jonathan Goldman's Reiki Chance on YouTube. I love all things by Jonathan Goldman. Check, check him out. Check his YouTube channel out. Buy some of his CDs. He's put a lot of wonderful healing CDs out. That's Jonathan Goldman, Reiki Chance. So today I want to talk about uh, COVID, coronavirus. I don't know what to call it. The pandemic, coronavirus, COV-19. Everything that we're dealing with right now in the world, the thing that's stopping our economies, the thing that's killing our relatives and putting our friends and family members in the hospital, the thing that is putting our healthcare workers at risk and our grocers and truck drivers at risk, there's this massive change happening. And a lot of people have been asking me what it means or what it's about and what my insight is on it as an intuitive, particularly as a medical intuitive. and It took me a while before I started to actually talk about it because I wanted to be very careful about what I said and how I said it. You know, I think as a medical intuitive, I have a responsibility to deliver information to people about health that is helpful and never hurtful, that is educational without being uh, scary. And that's a challenge, especially in times like this. And so, you know, I receive intuitive information from a higher source on a regular basis. And I've received a few um, bits of intuitive information, some of which is now known. I put this out in a post about a, a week or so ago. So let me just reiterate some of the things I've already talked about and just summarize what I'm getting thus far. Uh, First, I'm getting that this is going to last for months and not weeks. Uh, Other people are now saying that, so this may not be news to many of you. Uh, But I felt that a couple weeks ago. This is going to be months, not weeks. This is going to be massive and global, and this is not going to be something that comes and goes quickly. It's also not going to be something that just affects certain people or a few people or certain countries. It's going to affect the world. I also am getting that the reason this virus is affecting different people in different ways has to do with its relationship to other viruses. So um, the way that the coronavirus is working is that it is teaming up with other viruses already in the body. And that's why some people get very sick and die quickly and other people recover. I know a lot of the data has shown some correlations with age, but if you look more closely at the data, and there's been more and more studies coming out, you'll see that people with uh, underlying conditions are the ones that are dying regardless of age. And it just so happens that older people have more underlying conditions. Now what I got intuitively is that what's really causing people to die is the presence of other viruses in their body that are predisposing them to not be able to handle this virus. Now, this is just my opinion based on intuition I'm receiving. I am not a uh, licensed physician. I am not a scientist. And so I'm not suggesting that anything that I have to say should trump anything that one of these healthcare or scientific experts says. I'm just trying to offer what I have also received in the hopes that it can be helpful. And so what I'm getting is that these viruses that are already in the body are teaming up with this virus that's coming into the body brand new. And so... You know, what I've seen working with a lot of clients over a period of many years is that a lot of illness that people come to me with is caused by viruses or bacteria in the body. And a lot of people will have viruses and bacteria in the body which aren't really causing them any problems. And so they're what you might call dormant. And then something happens to activate them in certain people's bodies. And it's really interesting how 
you know, two different people can get, um, you know, mononucleosis when they're in their teens or something. And one person, it just never comes up again in their life. And the other person develops, um, Epstein-Barr develops all kinds of symptoms and all kinds of problems. Um, same virus, different outcome. And so I, you do see that these viruses are not inherently problematic. You know, a lot of these viruses that we have in our body, uh, we can exist with them without having any problems. Uh, but then uh, in some people's bodies, they wreak havoc. And by the same token, with this coronavirus, you know, some people handle it very well and other people don't. And so what I am what I am getting is that there is a connection between the viruses already in the body and the coronavirus. And so somebody with a history of a certain number of, a certain viral load in their body is going to be less well equipped to fight off this virus. Um, I have no proof for this. Um, this is just what I'm, what I'm picking up intuitively. Another thing that I'm getting is that as devastating as this virus is for the globe, it's also going to bring a lot of positive change to the planet. And so I've been talking for years about the shift in consciousness, about the global shift in consciousness where that's raising our vibration, that's causing people to expand their consciousness, to become more aware, and that's going to lead to um, a decline in a lot of the uh, woes in our planet, you know, starvation, war, rape, fighting, you know. Um, and so there's a lot of people on the planet who've been talking about the shift in consciousness for some time. Some people call it the ascension. And I do think that this virus is contributing to that shift in consciousness, although it's uh, probably not at all obvious at this point because right now we're in the midst of dealing with the suffering, with people dying. And it's hard to see a silver lining when you see people dying. And I also think we have to be careful about even talking about that because the people whose family members are dying may not want to hear that right now. Um, don't want to hear that, oh, there's some good that's going to come out of this. Um, but I do think there is some good that's going to come out of this. Um... I do think that um, there's something else that we can do in terms of addressing the spread of the virus, and that is to address the energy of the virus. And so one of the things I'm also getting about, about this virus and, about, and I've gotten this generally about viruses is that viruses are energetically associated with um, emotions related to victimhood, oppression, and bullying. And so if you look at the virus, you know what it looks like. It looks like a little monster. You know, it's got all those little pokey things sticking out. And when you talk to people who have these kind of chronic illnesses, you know, like um, chronic fatigue syndrome or, um, you know, MS or uh, fibromyalgia or, you know, different conditions that are chronic and that... Um, are long-term and are debilitating and that are associated with viruses, um, you often will find that these people have this feeling like they have been treated unfairly, like they've been victimized, like they were just living their life and then all of a sudden they got this uh, condition and it debilitated them and destroyed their lives. And so there's this feeling that people will have of feeling attacked or victimized. And then oftentimes the people that have those kind of illnesses will have the same kind of feeling when they try to get diagnosed or treated. And that's because, um, you know, Western medicine has a hard time with a lot of chronic illnesses. Um, they have a hard time figuring out what to do with people who have these conditions. And so... It's, it's largely because there isn't really an understanding of what causes them. And so the only thing that can really be provided is a diff, you know, some palliative care or kind of symptom relief. And because there are a lot of women, for example, that have a lot of chronic illnesses that people don't understand that well, 
there's also been a tendency um, of a lot of healthcare practitioners to treat those women as if it's all in their head or it's all emotional or they're imagining it or they're exaggerating it or they're being dramatic. And so a lot of people with chronic fatigue syndrome, for example, have had the experience of being discounted uh, by their doctors. And if we go back in time, historically, we can look at other illnesses that um, where doctors had a similar reaction. So epilepsy, before epilepsy was, you know, they, they really understood epilepsy and diagnosed it and figured out what was causing it. Um, it was often uh, attributed to hysteria in women. Uh, and sometimes, you know, hysteria in men. But there was this belief that, oh, these women are just hysterical and they're having these fits. And there wasn't an understanding that there was actually something going on in the brain. Um, and of course, we have that also with a lot of women's conditions, so with PMS and uh, fibroids and polyps. You know, there was a time where uh, when women hemorrhaged, when women had these problems, it was attributed to hysteria or to, you know, emotional excess. And so what you'll see with people who have certain conditions that are not well understood is that they will feel oppressed by their healthcare practitioners when they keep going to see them and keep you know being told oh there's nothing wrong or we can't find it or you just need therapy you need psychological help or you're it can't be as bad as you say it is and so then what happens is the patient feels uh, oppressed even more oppressed they already feel oppressed by the virus and then they feel further oppressed by um, the absence of compassion or the absence of understanding And so I've seen that with a lot of patients who have virus-mediated illness. And what came with regard to coronavirus is that, like many other viruses, it feeds off of the energy of bullying or oppression or victimhood. And so one of the things that's going to be really important for us going forward is to be able to remove ourselves from any type of um, dialogues or interactions or any thinking that casts uh, anybody in a victim or oppressor oppressive role. And I know that's easier said than done because there are a lot of people in the world who are oppressed and there are a lot of victims and there are a lot of bullies, especially in this country, the United States, you know, we have at, the, at our highest levels, bullying is the norm. But what I am hearing about this virus is that it feeds off of that energy. And so we need to resist uh, the tendency to start feeling or thinking in those terms. Uh, when people get the coronavirus and when uh, and, and if they're not treated well or they don't receive the proper medical attention um, or they aren't allowed to be tested or they aren't allowed to be admitted to the hospital, um, there's, of course, going to be a tendency for people to feel oppressed or victimized. Uh, But we really have to resist that um, temptation. We have to resist that natural feeling uh, because it feeds the virus. And uh, by the same token, any kind of bullying, you know, so like people uh, bullying people who have the condition or bullying people who um, don't, don't um, don't follow the rules or people who um, follow the rules and we think they're being excessively cautious or paranoid. You know, any kind of bullying of anybody um, is going to just strengthen the virus. And so that's, I think, really important part of how we deal with the virus is, is thinking about how we think about it and how we feel about it and how we interact with one another. Fortunately, we are seeing a lot of people in the United States, and this is probably true throughout throughout the world, but we're seeing a lot of people in the United States um, coming together, helping each other, being there for one another, people who are really um, rising to the occasion and becoming better people because of the crisis. And so that's what's going to help us uh, wipe this out is that spirit of unity, that spirit of, you know, coming together and being there for one another 
and uh, letting letting go of judgment, uh, at least temporarily. I know it is it is difficult. Um, you know, I had a incident just last week where one of my former students was going on Facebook and he was uh, ranting against old people. And this guy is not real young, but he's in his 30s maybe. And so he's a te- technically a millennial, perhaps. And, and he was ranting about how um, this virus was all about the old people and that they should all stay home and he's really sick of going out and seeing old people walking around and they should all be at home and it's because of them that all of these young people are losing their jobs and their mortgages and their livelihood and he was in effect blaming the old people for the illness and um and then you also have other people who are blaming the young people right saying look at all of these young people who are out on the beach partying and they're having gatherings and they're doing these corona challenges we have these young people going on their social media and licking toilets and coughing on produce and just doing really outrageous things to signify that they don't take this seriously and so now there are understandably older people who are who are uh, you know afraid that the young people are the ones that are spreading it and the thing is, neither approach is going to work for us. Um, you know, this isn't a young people, old people thing. This isn't uh, a healthy people, sick people thing. This, there are no camps in this. Everybody is vulnerable. And it's true that those with pre-existing conditions are more vulnerable and those who are not healthy and who don't have the same resources as other people are more vulnerable. 